Established over 10 years, Time Computers is the UK's leading direct supplier of PCs to home users and small businesses. Systems are assembled in Britain using the latest components and technology to give you complete confidence and peace of mind. Hello and welcome, and thank you for buying your PC from Time Computer Systems. Time's aim is for you to get the best possible benefit and enjoyment from owning a PC. So, in this video, we'll show you everything you need to know about your new computer. The program lasts for about an hour, and it's divided up into sections. If you're a beginner, we suggest that you watch the whole video before you start using your PC. If you're a more experienced user, you may not need to watch all the sections, but you may well find some of them useful to familiarize yourself with features that you may not have seen before. With the help of the menu system, you should quickly be able to find the sections you want. We'll show you what to do when your PC arrives and how to connect all the pieces of hardware together. Then, we'll take you through the procedures when you use your PC for the first time. We'll show you how to install software and install printers and other add-on pieces of equipment. And finally, we'll tell you how to contact the customer support centre if you have any real problems. The chances are that you're watching this programme before your PC's arrived. So, in this section, we'll show you what you should do when it's delivered. When you ordered your computer, you were quoted a delivery date. Now, this is normally 10 to 14 working days after your payment has cleared. In that time, your PC will be built and will have its software preloaded and be thoroughly tested for many hours. Your computer will be delivered by reputable courier. If you're out, when the courier calls, he'll leave a note so that you can phone to arrange a suitable time for him to return. Now, the whole system will come in a number of boxes, usually three or four, depending on what you've ordered. When it arrives, check the number of boxes against the courier's consignment note. Make sure, too, that there's no external damage to any of the boxes. If you have any problems, contact the customer care centre, and we'll show you how to do that later on. First of all, take the boxes into the room where you'll be using your PC. As you unpack the boxes, check that you have all the bits and pieces. Now, this will depend on the system that you ordered. But in general, in the main system box, you should have the system unit, the keyboard, a power cable, and a mouse. There'll also be a binder containing documentation and software that relates to your system. The monitor box will contain the monitor and its stand, and a power cable, and a user manual. Finally, any additional hardware and software, such as speakers, a joystick, and CDs, will be in the accessories box. The invoice will normally be in this box as well. Also included is your Windows 98 CD. Your PC comes with Windows preloaded and ready to use, so this CD is just for backup purposes. If some things appear to be missing, check all the boxes and check the invoice. Some items may be marked to follow. Now, this means that they were out of stock when your PC was shipped, and they'll be sent on to you shortly. You will, however, have all the necessary equipment to get you started. If the missing items aren't marked to follow, contact the customer care center, as we'll show you later in the video. After you've unpacked all the hardware, do keep the boxes and packing materials safe, because you can then use them again if you need to move the PC or return it for an upgrade or a repair. Now you know that you've got all the right bits and pieces, you can start connecting them together. But before you do that, it is worth thinking about the best place to put your PC. So, here are a few do's and don'ts. The PC should stand on a hard, flat surface with plenty of room around it for all the cables and accessories. You should make sure that the area is well ventilated and keeps to a reasonable room temperature. Obviously, you need to make sure there are power points handy and a telephone socket if you'll be using a modem. And finally, don't place the PC in direct sunlight or near a radiator or any magnetic sources such as stereo speakers. OK, so when you've chosen a good spot, you can start putting your PC together. 
Now there are two basic types of PC design, desktop and mini tower. If you have a desktop case, it's normal to place the monitor on top of the case. The monitor should be attached to its stand, by the way. If you have a mini tower like this, place it next to the monitor. It's usually best to have the case on the side of the monitor, away from the side where you'll be using the mouse. So if you're right-handed, this will mean placing it on the left-hand side of the monitor. All the pieces of hardware, your keyboard, mouse, joystick and so on, plug into the back of the case. Whether it's a mini tower or a desktop, the connections will be the same. Most of the cables will be connected into this connector panel. With your PC, you'll receive this Getting Started leaflet. Now this diagram is supplied to help you with the connections. First, connect the keyboard. Then, connect the mouse to the mouse port. Next, connect the monitor. The monitor connector has screws on each side to hold it securely in place. Now, connect the speakers to the socket with a speaker symbol marked Line Out or Speaker on the connector panel. Now, don't confuse this with another socket marked SPK, which may be on the modem. The speakers also have their own power supply. If you have a microphone, this should be plugged into the socket marked Mic In on the connector panel. Again, don't be tempted to use any mic sockets that may be on the modem. If your system was supplied with the optional headset, you'll notice that this has two plugs. Connect the plug marked with a microphone symbol to the connector panel's mic socket and the one marked with a speaker to the connector panel's line out socket. Now, if this is already occupied by the cable from the speakers, you can connect it to the phone socket on the front of one of the speakers. The wires will separate easily if required. The joystick should be connected to the game port on the connector panel. On the connector panel, you'll also see this socket called the USB connector. More and more devices use this type of connector, and when you add extra equipment, such as a scanner or some types of printer, it'll make installing them much simpler. You may have purchased a system with a TV out feature, which allows you to use a standard television instead of a PC monitor. To use TV out, you'll need a TV with a SCART socket, like this, and the optional connecting lead. Connect the SCART plug to the TV, the video plug to the TV out connector, and the audio plug to the line out socket. Then select AV on the television to view the display. TV out is best used for games and multimedia applications. For other types of software, a standard PC monitor is recommended. Now you can connect the system to the power supply. First, connect the monitor power cable to the monitor. Plug it into the wall socket and switch on. And you can do the same with the power cable, which goes into the back of the PC. Finally, switch on the main power switch on the back of the PC case. Now do check that all the connections are secure. You must never connect or disconnect any part of the system while it's switched on, because that could damage it. So, now it's all together, it's worth thinking about your position as you use your PC. Now PCs are addictive, and you could find yourself spending many hours in front of the screen, so it is important that you're comfortable. Ideally, you should sit on a chair with height adjustment. Now, when you're using the keyboard, your forearms should be horizontal and your elbows level with the desktop. The monitor should be at arm's length from you, and your eyes should be level with the top of the monitor casing. Position the monitor so that you avoid reflections from windows or lighting. And finally, place the keyboard a few inches from the edge of the desk so that you can rest your hands when you're not using it. OK. Now, before you actually switch on, let's take a closer look at the hardware and see what each component does. Now is probably a good time to explain the difference between hardware and software. Hardware refers to all the physical parts of the system, the keyboard, the mouse, the case, and the individual components that are inside it, such as the hard disk, the CD-ROM drive, and so on. Software, on the other hand, refers to the programs which run on the computer. There are two main types of software, operating system software and application software. Operating system software is the software that controls the computer. Most PCs these days use an operating system called Windows. Application software are the individual programs that you'll use to do work. You use an accounting application, for example, to manage your finances. Now, we'll talk about software more later on.
But first, let's get back to the hardware and look at the PC case. All PCs have the same buttons, though the exact layout may vary from model to model. Now this button is the main on-off switch that you'll use day by day. When you do switch on, this green light will come on to show that the PC is powered up. This is the reset switch, and it's used to restart the computer without switching off the power. This process is known as rebooting, and it's sometimes necessary, for example, when installing new programs. Now this symbol, which looks a bit like a drum, represents the hard disk drive, which is inside the computer case. And the red light next to it will come on whenever the hard disk is active. Programs and work are kept in things called files, and these are normally stored on the hard disk. Reading or writing large amounts of information can sometimes take a few seconds. And this light lets you know that the hard drive is working away. By the way, the computer uses the letter C to refer to the hard drive, so it's often called the C drive. Now, we've just been talking about the hard disk drive. On the front of the case, you'll see this floppy disk drive. Now, floppy disks these days are enclosed in these neat plastic covers, so they don't actually look floppy anymore. They're used to store work files and for making backup copies of data. Now, it's very important that you put the disk into the drive the correct way around. On one edge of the disk is a shutter, and this edge goes into the drive first. Put it in with the writing on the disk facing upwards. Now, you can see a small arrow on the left of the disk, and that'll help you insert it correctly. Push the disk into the drive until it clicks into position. To remove it, press the button and pull it out. Some systems may be fitted with the LS120 floppy drive. Now, these have a much higher storage capacity than these normal high-density disks, but they look very similar, and they're used in very much the same way. All floppy disks have what's called a write protection tab. When the tab is down and there's no hole, you can save information to the disk. If you want to avoid the risk of the data on the disk being accidentally erased, slide the tab so that the hole is open. Now, the floppy disk drive is usually referred to as the A drive by the computer. Floppy disks need careful looking after, and you can find some do's and don'ts in the user manual. Now, the third type of drive in your PC is the CD-ROM drive. Now, this is referred to by the letter D. This reads the CDs that most software is now sold on, but it can play standard music CDs too. When you buy software, there's usually an install process where some or all of the programs on the CD are copied across to the computer's hard disk drive. Loading CDs is very easy. There may be one or two buttons on the front panel, and the one with an arrow pointing upwards will open the tray. Simply place the CD in the round section in the tray with the writing facing upwards, then push the button again to close it. It is very important not to push or pull the tray on its way in or out. Now, some CDs will begin installing a program as soon as the tray is closed. That's called autoplay. You then simply follow the instructions which appear on the screen. Some time systems may come fitted with the latest DVD, or digital versatile disk drives. Now, these look and work in a very similar way to CD drives. In fact, they can also read CD-ROM discs, but they hold much more information. Now, this means that DVD-ROM discs can contain full-length movies and even more exciting games and comprehensive multimedia programs. DVD systems are regionalized, and some DVD-ROM discs, usually those containing movies, may be coded to work only on PC systems in a certain region, such as Europe whilst others will work with systems in any region. Now, the keyboard is an essential part of the PC system. Part of it looks like a typewriter keyboard, but there are lots of other important keys as well. So let's take a look at some of them. This key is particularly important. It's the return or enter key. This key starts a new line when you're typing text, but it's also used to send information to the computer. When you've typed in a command, pressing Enter tells the PC to carry out that instruction. Along the top of the keyboard are a series of function keys, labelled F1 to F12. These are a quick way of giving certain commands to the computer, such as printing a document or saving a file. On the right of the keyboard, you'll see a numeric keypad. Now, this offers a handy way of entering lots of figures. This section contains keys for moving around on the screen. 
For example, if you're working on a document in a word processor program, the point at which any new typing will appear is marked by this flashing line called the cursor. If you want to type somewhere else in the document, you must move the cursor to that point before you begin adding the new text, and you move the cursor with these arrow keys. In fact, the arrow keys are used to move around many types of program, as you'll see. These keys above, marked Home, End, and so on, move the cursor around the page in bigger jumps compared to the single steps that the arrow keys make. Along the bottom of the alphabet part of the keyboard, there are some additional keys that may be new to you. Now, this key, which stands for Control, and this one, which stands for Alternate, are used with the alphabet keys to give instructions to software programs. For example, pressing Control and S together saves a file. There are also these keys, which have special functions in certain pieces of software. Well, that's the keyboard. Now, let's have a look at the mouse. Using the mouse is another way of giving instructions to the computer. By moving the mouse, you move this arrow around the screen. When it's over the button for the command that you want, you click the left button to carry out that command. Let's see how it works. I hold the mouse like this, and by sliding it around the mouse mat, I'm moving the arrow on the screen. The screen contains various symbols. These are called icons, and they stand for different commands. Now, I've typed this letter in the word processor program. Now, this icon here means print out the document, so I move the mouse arrow over that and click the left mouse button to tell the PC that I want to select that command. Now, the mouse is also used to select menus from the menu bar at the top of the screen. Now, in most Windows programs, you'll see this row of words near the top of the screen. If you click on any of these, a list or menu drops down with a list of commands. Move the arrow over the one that you want and click again to select it. Now, I'll give you an example. Let's say I want to check the spelling in this document. If I click on the word edit, a menu drops down, and one of the options is check spelling. So, click on that, and the program will show me any spelling mistakes that I've made. Now, most mice have two buttons, and normally you would click the left one to send instructions in this way. The right button is used to pick up special menus in some programs. Now, a couple of other points about using the mouse. To select some items, such as launching a new program, you have to double-click the left mouse button quite quickly. Now, it can take a little bit of practice. Another mouse skill which is important is called clicking and dragging. If you select certain items and then continue to hold down the left mouse button while you move the mouse, you literally drag that item around the screen like that. Now, this idea is used in all sorts of ways, such as drawing a line in a design program or moving work files between folders. Some systems may have been supplied with the IntelliMouse or Wheel Mouse. It looks very similar to an ordinary mouse, but it has a wheel between the two buttons, which can be turned to allow you to scroll through, for example, a word processor document. The wheel also acts as a third button and its function may be different depending on the software you're using. Using the mouse can take some getting used to, but it makes using a PC much easier. There's a tutorial in the Windows program which will help you master some of the mouse operations that we've talked about. So, think about the best location for your PC. Connect together the various components using the Getting Started leaflet to help you, and make sure the connections are secure. Hardware refers to the physical components of the system, while software refers to the programs. There are two types of software. Operating software, which on your PC is called Windows, and application software, programs that perform a specific task. You've got three drives on your machine. The hard disk or C drive. The A drive, which is either a floppy drive or a high-capacity LS120 drive and a D drive, which is either a CD-ROM drive or a DVD-ROM drive. Well, now we're ready to switch on the PC. But before you do, it's wise to switch on any other peripherals, that's extra add-on equipment like printers, first. Oh, and don't forget to switch the monitor on. Now we'll switch on the PC itself. The computer will immediately spring into life. 
Now you'll see a variety of text messages move up the screen very quickly, and the Windows logo may appear a couple of times too. Well, don't worry, because that's all perfectly normal. The PC is booting up, as it's called, and it'll do this every time you switch on. After a few seconds, everything will settle down. The first thing you'll see is this screen. It asks you if you'd like to have a tutorial to show you how to use the mouse. Press N if you want to have that lesson, but we're happy about using the mouse, so we'll press the Escape key. Now we see this box, which is called a dialog box. And what this means is that the computer's asking us for some information. First, it wants us to enter our name and, if applicable, the name of the company that we work for. We then click on Next. Well, we're now asked to read the license agreement for the Windows program. These are the conditions under which we're allowed to use the software. So, read that and click on Accept and then Next. Now, we're asked for our product key. Now, this is a unique series of letters and numbers that's used to register our copy of Windows. The key can be found on the Windows CD package that was supplied with the system. Now, take care to type it in exactly as it appears. Now, we're asked for a username and, optionally, a password. If you don't want to use a password, just click on OK to move on. If you do decide to enter a password, whatever we type in here will have to be entered whenever we use the machine in the future, so do remember it. I'll put in the name Phil and the password Time. The password displays as asterisks, so I have to re-enter it to make sure I've got it right. When you've done this, the PC will reset itself. It's starting up again, but this time using the information that you've given it. OK, the PC is up and running again, but it now wants us to make a recovery diskette. You're supplied with an orange diskette like this for the very purpose. Now, the computer copies special information about itself onto the diskette. You'll only use the recovery diskette if you have problems with your PC. And without it, the technical support team will only be able to offer limited help. You can find details of how and when to use the recovery disk in the user manual. When you've made the disk, keep it somewhere safe and don't use it for anything else. So we've done that, and now the PC will tell us to restart it, and we'll do that by pressing any key. OK, all that happens when you first switch on. But what about when you switch on in the future? Well, after a few seconds, it'll give you a choice with this menu. Do we want to boot up into Windows, as you would normally want to, or do we want to boot up into DOS? Well, DOS is just a different operating system. It gives us special memory configurations, and we'd really only use it if we were playing some older games. As I said, normally you would choose the Windows option, and if you don't choose either, the computer will automatically go into Windows after about 15 seconds. You'll be asked for your password if you decided to use one. So, here we are in Windows. The first time we're given four choices on this Welcome to Windows screen. Now you can disregard the first option, Registering Windows, because your system's already registered with time. Option two takes you step by step through connecting to the Internet by opening an account with an Internet service provider. Option three gives you a guide to Windows 98. Option four takes you to a selection of programs to maintain your computer. Now we recommend that you choose Discover Windows 98 to learn about Windows. That'll be useful even if you are an experienced user. To get rid of the welcome screen next time you switch on, just click in the box in the bottom left corner and then click the X in the top right of the window. Now before you start really using your computer, there are a couple more safety procedures that you're advised to go through. Now, the first is to make another diskette, this time a Windows startup disk. Then, if you ever have problems starting Windows, you can use the diskette to boot up from, and Windows will start using the settings on that. The Windows disk is different from the recovery disk that we made earlier, so you should remember to make both. To make the diskette, take one floppy disk and put it in the disk drive. Click on the Start button, then click on Settings and Control Panel. Then double-click on Add or Remove Programs and select Startup Disk. Then click on the Create Disk button. The PC will write the necessary data onto the diskette. When it's done that, take the diskette out, label it and keep it in a safe place. Well, this is the end of the special setup procedures for the first time you switch on. 
So, when you start for the first time, you'll be asked for some information, including the product key. So make sure you have the Windows 98 pack handy. You must make a recovery disk using the orange diskette and keep it in a safe place. Also, make a Windows disk and keep that safe too. Don't use those disks for anything else. Now, if you have some problems with the startup, here are some things to look at. First, check that all the cables are properly connected. And make sure that everything is plugged into the mains and that the power switch on the back of the PC is switched on. If the PC makes a constant bleeping noise when you switch on, make sure that there's nothing resting on the keyboard or that the mouse and keyboard cables aren't the wrong way round. If a message appears that says invalid system disk, it means there was a floppy disk in the drive when you switched on. Take it out and press any key. If you can't see anything on the display, check that the monitor is plugged in and switched on. Check that the cable from the PC is connected correctly. Try adjusting the brightness and contrast controls. If just some of the screen is visible, you can adjust the display using special controls. You'll find all the instructions in the monitor's manual. When your PC has booted up and the Windows program has started, you'll end up with a screen like this. There's a green or blue background with some small icons down the left-hand side. Now this whole area of the screen is called the desktop. It's where you'll do your work. These icons represent programs or folders containing groups of programs. And if you double-click on them, you launch those programs. But there are a couple of special ones to look at. If we double-click on My Computer, we get this. Now these icons represent all the parts of our computer. Now remember that the hard disk drive is called C, so if we double click on the C drive, we'll see these rows of folders. Folders are just that. If you imagine your hard disk drive as a big filing cabinet, then these folders group individual files together. Now you can see here a folder called My Documents. If we double click on that, we'll see all the documents that have been created. Now this is the recycle bin. When you want to erase or delete a file, you can simply drag that file over the bin and it'll be deleted. If you double click on the recycle bin, you can see what you've put in there. And if you decide you actually need it again, you simply drag it back. To get rid of files for good, you have to empty the recycle bin, but we'll show you how to do that later in the program. Well, that's the desktop. There's also this bar along the bottom. It's called the taskbar. Now you can see here on the right there's a clock. As we move across there are these four buttons. Now these are called quick launch buttons. You click these once to launch certain programs. This one for example launches a program called Outlook Express which you use to send email. And finally here on the left is the button that's called Start. Now this really is your starting point for opening programs so that you can do your work. So let's move the mouse pointer over that Start button and click and this menu pops up. As you can see, there are a number of options. Now, let's say we want to draw a picture. First of all, we need to start the Paint program, because that's the software that we'll use to draw the picture. So, we take the mouse arrow onto the word Programs on the menu. Now, you'll notice that some of the items have a black arrow beside them. Now, that means that there's a submenu underneath them. When the arrow is over the word Programs, the submenu pops up. Now here you can see several icons and these represent programs. Some of the programs are grouped together. We can tell this because this icon denotes a group. And beside the name of the group there's another small arrow which of course means there's a submenu. So we'll select the accessories group. Put the mouse arrow over the program group and the submenu appears showing the individual programs. Then if we click on paint it'll launch the paint program. Now, as you can see, the Paint program appears on the desktop already with a blank window for you to start drawing your picture. Now, you've probably noticed that programs appear in boxes on the desktop. Now, those are called Windows, and that's what the Windows program is all about. Now, by putting your mouse pointer over the colored bar at the top of the window, holding down the left mouse button, and then moving the mouse, you can drag the window around the desktop. Now, if you place the pointer over the corner of the window, like this, it changes to this double-headed arrow. 
Now again, hold down the left mouse button and move the mouse and the size of the window changes. Now if you look in the top right corner of the window, you can see these symbols. The cross on the right closes the program. This one is called the maximize button, that makes the window fill the desktop. Now when that happens, it changes to these two windows, and when you press that one, it goes back to its original size. Now this one is the minimize button. If you click on that, the window disappears. But what you do get is a button on the taskbar at the bottom that represents that program. So if we click on that, the program comes back. Now then, why is that so important? It becomes really useful when you're using more than one program because with Windows you can run several programs at the same time. That's called multitasking. So we've got the paint program running. Let's open another program and we'll do that in exactly the same way. From the start menu we can choose programs, Lotus Smart Suite and from this group of programs we'll choose WordPro which is a word processor. Now I'll open WordPro with a blank document ready for us to work on. There it is. Now I can resize the windows so that I can see both the Paint program and WordPro. And WordPro at the moment appears in front of Paint. Now the bar at the top of WordPro is coloured. That means that it's the active program. If I want to work in the Paint program, I just click in a bit of the Paint window that's showing and it jumps to the front and becomes the active program. Now by resizing the windows, I can actually see both of them at the same time. Now you'll notice that we now have two buttons on the taskbar, one for Paint and one for WordPro. Now by clicking on each of these, I can also select the one that I want. Now, everything that we've said about the windows that programs appear in also applies to the windows that work appears in within programs. So here I've got two documents open in WordPro and I can move between them in the same way. You'll notice on the Start menu there's the word Help. Now one of the great things about PCs is that you're never very far away from help when you need it. If you click on help, you'll see a dialog box, which lets you select help topics under chapters or an index, or you can even type in the word that you want help about, and it'll come up with detailed explanations telling you what you need to do. Selecting help from this menu gives you help on working Windows software. But most programs come with their own help section as well. Now you can access this by clicking on the help menu at the top of the screen or by pressing the F1 key at the top of the keyboard. Many programs come with tutorials and you'll usually find those under the help menu too. Click on the tutorial and you'll be given a step-by-step -step guide to the main features of the program. Many systems will come preloaded with Tutor Pro, an interactive training guide to Windows 98. Tutor Pro will teach you about the main features of Windows and help you with the most common tasks. Windows 98 also has its own tutorial and this is a good place to learn the basics as well. Now let's have a quick look at the programs and packages that come with your PC. The accessories group contains lots of useful functions such as a calculator and the paint program that we've already seen. There are also other groups including the programs for sending faxes playing some games and playing music CDs, video and other types of media. The Internet Explorer group contains all the programs for using the Internet and email. Lotus Smart Suite is the group that contains the main office programs. Continuing down, you may have programs for PC TV and the video phone, and we'll take a look at those a little bit later on. Now we've only mentioned some of the programs there, there are lots, lots more, and the best way to find out about them is simply click on them, open them up, and have a go. When you get your PC, you may have ordered the optional backup CD with copies of all the software on it. If you ever need to reinstall a program, you can do so from the backup CD. Now talking of backing things up, it is worthwhile also keeping copies of valuable work on floppy disks as well. Now the simplest way of doing this is to open a program here called Windows Explorer. Now on the left you'll see a branch-like representation of all the drives and folders that are on the PC. Here's the C drive, the hard disk, and here's the My Documents folder. Now if I click on the C drive, on the right I'll see all the folders here. Now say I want to back up all the files in the My Documents folder. I click on the folder, hold down the mouse button, and then drag the folder over to the left and onto the floppy drive icon. 
release that, and then the light illuminates on the floppy drive to show that it's busy copying all the files. Now, what if you buy some new software and want to use it on your PC? Well, you have to go through an installation procedure. Now, most programs these days come on CD, but you do still get some smaller programs on one or more floppy disks. So, we've got a new CD here. All I do is put it into the drive. Now, as we said earlier on, some CDs will start automatically. This one, as it happens, doesn't. So, I go to the Start menu, click on Run, and type in the instructions that came with the CD. In this case, I have to type D colon backslash setup dot exe, or exe. Now, I click on OK, and the PC starts copying the necessary files from the CD to the hard drive. Now, for some programs, that can take quite a long time, so you have to be patient. The computer will tell you when it's finished. When you've finished using your PC, it is very important that you close it down correctly. What you must never do is just press the off switch. That could easily damage the software and mean that you would lose some of your work files. What you should do is go back to the Start menu. You've probably noticed the shutdown option at the bottom. If you select that, you'll be given three options. Choose Shutdown and click on OK. If you have any programs still open and you haven't saved the files that you were working on, you'll be prompted to save them now. When you've done that, the PC will close down and switch off automatically. If for some reason you do switch off the PC without going through that procedure, the next time you switch on, Windows will run a program called ScanDisk. Now that will examine your hard disk drive to see if there is any damage or loss of data. In this section, we're going to take a look at using other pieces of hardware which are connected to your PC. We'll look at the modem, which connects us to the telephone line, the video phone, PC TV, printers, and other optional equipment. All of these things are called peripherals. They all have to be able to talk to the main bits of your PC, and for them to do this, they must be set up correctly. Let's look first at the modem. Now, the modem is a unit which converts computer data into a form that can be transmitted over telephone lines so you can both send and receive information via your standard telephone socket. Modems can be either internal or external. Most time PCs come with internal modems already installed, and all you can see of them is this row of sockets on the back of the case. It should have a cable attached, which goes from the modem to the telephone socket. Now, there are several things that modems allow you to do. You can send and receive faxes, access the internet, and use email, and use the video phone. So, let's take a look at all of these in turn. First of all, faxing. Now, you can use your PC to send and receive faxes. It can communicate with any other type of fax machine. It doesn't have to be another computer. To send a fax, double-click on the inbox to start Windows messaging. Now, the first time you do this, you need to provide information about yourself and your PC setup. Choose Tools and Services. Highlight Microsoft Fax and click on Properties. Then the User tab. Now fill in all the appropriate details and then click on the Modem tab and Properties. Check the information on how the PC is to answer incoming fax calls and change it if necessary. Keep clicking OK until you're back to the inbox. You won't need to do this again unless you wish to change any of the settings. To send a fax, click on Compose, followed by New Fax, and follow the on-screen instructions. To receive a fax, you need to have Inbox open. Whether the phone is answered by the PC automatically depends on the choices you made in the initial setup. Now, with Auto Answer, the procedure is automatic. Now, that's how you send faxes using the special faxing programs. But you can also send faxes of documents directly from the programs that created them. Now, you do this by sending the document to the fax program instead of to a printer. Now, let's say I've written this letter and want to fax it to somebody. Now, normally, if I press the print icon, this letter would be printed out on my printer over here. But if I go to the file menu and select print, you'll see that my printer is highlighted at the moment, but I just change that to Microsoft Fax. Now, when I click on print, 
I'm taken through a series of dialogue boxes asking me where I want to send the fax to, and then off it goes. Now, some systems are supplied with a voice modem. This means that your PC can handle speech as well, so it can act as a telephone answering machine. You'll find details of how to set this up in the user manual. Well, so much for faxing. Now, we said that you can also use your modem to connect to the Internet. To get on the Internet, you need to sign up with an Internet Service Provider, or ISP. For a monthly or annual fee, they give you an email address so that you can send and receive email, some space on their own computers called web space, which you can use to create your own website, and, most importantly, a point of entry to the net. Now, computer magazines and the press are full of adverts for ISPs. Check the features that they offer and the rates they charge before you commit yourself. Most ISPs will provide you with software so that you can use all of the features of cyberspace. Now, you need three main pieces of software. First, a web browser. This allows you to access websites, the millions of interlinked pages that compose the graphical and multimedia content of the Internet. Sites range from those of multinational corporations to the home pages of individuals. Some sites will have special areas where you can download files. Second, you need email software. Now, this is similar to a word processing application and allows you to create and send emails to all corners of the world. Your ISP will assign you a unique email address and email sent to this will be stored on the ISP's computer until you make the connection and download it to your own PC. Thirdly, you need a newsgroup reader. News groups are online discussion forums which use email to exchange news and views. Over 30,000 groups are in existence on every topic of interest imaginable. Windows comes preloaded with these applications ready to use, or your own ISP may supply you with alternatives. The online services folder on your desktop contains offers from various ISPs so that you can sign up and get online straight away. Double-click on the icon of the ISP that interests you and follow the instructions that appear on screen. Have your credit card details ready. Some ISPs will give you a free trial period, but not all of them. Now, once you've connected to the net, use your browser to navigate the web by typing in the URL of the website that you're interested in. URL stands for Uniform Resource Locator. It's the unique name by which a site can be identified. Launch Explorer 4 by clicking on the quick launch bar. Then type in the URL that you want. Most URLs start with HTTP colon forward slash forward slash www dot followed by the site name. Hyperlinks on a page are used to move you to another page or even another site by a single click of the mouse. The mouse pointer changes to a hand when it touches a hyperlink and the link itself changes color if you've already visited it. The software remembers the pages that you've visited, and using the forward and back arrows on the browser, you can quickly return to previously visited sites. You can save your favorite URLs as bookmarks, so that you don't need to remember their names the next time you want to visit. Now, if you're not sure where the information you want to find will be, use the search button on the browser. When you join up with an ISP, they'll let you have access to a global search facility, which allows you to type in certain key words that may help define what you're looking for. For example, football, supporters clubs, and Barcelona. The search program then sifts through literally millions of websites for these three keywords and will present you with a list of matching sites. And this takes only a few seconds. OK, so that's the modem. But what if you have problems? The answer may be one of these. Make sure that the problem isn't at the other end. Is the person you're trying to communicate with ready and able to receive data? Is the modem cable plugged properly into the back of the PC and the telephone socket? Try and avoid very long telephone extension cables, as these can cause problems. You mustn't have too many phones on your line. Try disconnecting some. If you still have problems, try the Windows 98 modem troubleshooter under the Help menu. If you can't send a fax, make sure that Inbox is set up and running. If you can't receive a fax, check Inbox as well, and make sure that the Answer After So Many Rings box is activated. 
Now, let's have a look at the video phone. This optional package uses a small video camera like this, which plugs into the modem or TV card. You'll also need a headset or a microphone as well. Even without the video camera, you can still receive video calls. So, connect your camera and run the video phone application. Select Window and Self View to display the camera view. Now, if it's not possible to select Self View, double-click the Restore Video Phone Factory Settings icon in the Maintenance folder. Select the appropriate option for configuration with or without the camera attached and click on Set as the above. Remember, though, that the video phone uses standard telephone lines, which can be susceptible to interference and poor picture quality. If the pictures look poor, the best solution is often to hang up and connect again. The PC TV system, if it's fitted, is completely separate from the video phone. It lets you watch television and view teletext from your desktop. You can also capture images from television or a video recorder. PC TV works via a card in the PC. You can see the back of it here. It has a standard RF socket, which is used to plug in a TV aerial or a video cassette recorder. Now, the first time you use the PC TV software, it'll automatically tune into and store the TV channels that it finds, and it assigns them numbers. But you can rename them with more meaningful names like BBC One and Channel Four, for example, if you prefer. Now, once tuned in, you can move between channels by using the channel buttons on the TV software menu bar or by using the function keys on the keyboard. The quality of the picture will depend on the standard of television reception in your area. And remember, you will need a TV license if you don't already have one. Now, this is a digital camera. It takes still pictures and stores them in computer memory rather than on film like a normal camera. Now, with a digital camera like this, you'll get a cable and some software. Now, this will let you download the pictures from the camera to your PC so that you can email them or print them out. The cable for the camera plugs into the USB port or, failing that, the COM port on the back of the PC. If you have one of the optional interactive toys for the PC, like Barney here, then plug in the batteries, connect the transmitter unit to the PC's joystick port and run the software on the supplied CD to control the toy. Now the cable is split so that you can still plug in a joystick as well. Another optional peripheral is this scanner, which comes complete with its own cable, which you use to connect it to the printer port. To connect the printer as well, plug the cable from the printer into the back of the scanner like this. Finally, in this part of the program, we'll look at printers. Now, the printer's job is quite simple. It produces a paper output of any work you've created on the PC, be it a letter, a chart, or a picture. Now, you need to connect it to the parallel port on your PC. That's this one here. All printers should be supplied with their own software and instructions, which you should follow to get them connected and installed. Here, we're going to install the Epson printer, which comes with a CD containing all the necessary software. Insert the CD in the drive and the disc will autoplay, presenting you with a menu from which you choose Install. Select the printer model from the list displayed and click on OK. Now this printer comes with its own online help and you should install this on your computer by clicking on Next, then on the Install to Hard Disk button, then Next again to complete the installation. If you have problems printing, check the obvious. Is the printer plugged in and switched on? Is the printer cable connected correctly? Is the printer online? Is there an ink or toner cartridge in the printer? And is there some paper loaded? If all that's OK, try a self-test on the printer. It'll tell you how to do this in the printer manual. If this is OK, check that the printer is the default printer for your system and that it is selected. Finally, try the Windows 98 Printer Troubleshooter under the Help menu. To keep your PC running at its optimum performance, it is a good idea to perform some routine maintenance. Hey, but don't worry, we're not asking you to get your screwdriver out. As you use your PC, you're constantly storing files on your hard drive reading them, deleting them, and then adding more files, and so on. 
So over time, the hard disk drive can become fragmented with information not stored in the best way for reading and writing it quickly. So, there are a number of programs which check and tidy up your hard disk to keep it working efficiently. You should run these every month or so to keep your PC at its best. Now you'll find these programs in the Accessories Program group under System Tools. The first is ScanDisk. Now this checks to see that data is stored properly on your hard disk. If it finds a problem, it can normally carry out a repair and everything will be okay. Just follow the instructions that it gives you. You'll most commonly come across ScanDisk if the machine is switched off without being shut down properly. The program then runs automatically next time you switch on to make sure that everything's okay. Next is Defragmenter. Now, when files are written onto your hard disk, they're not always written in one long piece. The PC likes to fill up gaps on the hard drive, so files may be split up into smaller units called sectors. Now, these sectors are written onto the hard drive to fill up the gaps left by deleted files. When the hard drive's new, things are neat and tidy. But over time, files become increasingly scattered, and that slows up the time needed to read them. The Defragmenter program reads all the files on your hard disk and reorganizes them into continuous sectors. Now, this process can take anything up to half an hour, and it's worth doing about every couple of months. Disk cleanup is rather different. Now this program looks for files on your hard disk that are no longer needed. These won't affect your work files, but other types of file that the PC creates in order to work, but then sometimes doesn't delete. Then there's the recycle bin that we saw earlier. Now if you double click on the recycle bin, you can see a whole number of files here that have been deleted. Now if I did want to get one back, I would highlight it, and then go to the file menu and select restore. Now this puts the file back in the folder where it originally was. But, as you can see, you can very quickly end up with a lot of files in the recycle bin, and they're taking up space and slowing up the hard disk. So, to empty the bin, I again go to the File menu and select Empty Recycle Bin. Now they've all gone, and I can't get them back. The last piece of software that you should run regularly is antivirus. Now you may have heard of so-called computer viruses. These are hidden programs that can arrive on your PC without you knowing, normally via a floppy disk or over the internet. Now, viruses affect PCs in different ways. Some cause messages to appear on the screen. Others can cause serious damage to your system. They're written by computer programmers, sometimes as a joke, but sometimes with more malicious intentions. Antivirus is a program that will detect whether there are any viruses on your system and then remove them. As we said, the most common source of viruses is floppy disks which have been swapped between lots of machines. So, be careful about the floppy disks that you allow into your PC. Floppy disks and CD-ROMs from reputable companies will usually have been checked for viruses. But if you have used any that you're not sure about, it would be worth running antivirus to keep your system clean. In this program, we've given you the help you need to get started with your PC. It may help you to watch parts of the program again in the future to refresh your memory. And don't forget the user guide manual, which gives more detailed information about the topics that we've covered. If you have more serious problems, time is here to help. There are a number of ways of getting in touch depending on the nature of the problem and whether you bought your machine mail order or through one of our stores. Anyone can call the telephone support numbers. But if you bought your machine from a Time store, you can also contact the service technicians there. If you have a problem in the first 30 days after you've received your PC, there's a special helpline number. The telephone numbers for all the helplines are listed in the user manual. And you'll need to have your invoice handy, and you'll be asked to enter the first four digits of the invoice number when you make the call. The first 30 days support line is for hardware and software inquiries related to the setting up of your system. Please don't call with delivery issues or general queries about using software. You can find answers to those questions from the online help screens or the user manuals. When you call the helpline, it's useful if you can be near your PC and have it switched on. The operators may ask you to carry out some procedures while they talk to you or they may ask you to try something and then call back when you've done so. 
After your first 30 days, or for delivery and invoice queries, there are other numbers to call, again, depending on the problem. There's one number for technical hardware support and another for non-technical support, including delivery inquiries. If you have problems with operating software, there's another number to call. Now, this is a chargeable service using a premium rate telephone number. Again, it makes sense to be in front of your PC when you make the call. If the support staff advise you to return the system to the head office service centre, you'll be given an authorization number called an RMA number. When your PC was delivered, you will have received a computer system return form and a number of important notice labels like these. Now fill these in and remember to put on the RMA number. Without that, the machine will not be accepted. Pack the machine up in the original boxes and put one of the labels onto each box. Depending on the nature of the problem, you may not need to return the whole system, perhaps only the main unit. The support staff will let you know. It's also important to back up any of your work files onto floppy disks and keep them. Depending on the type of work being carried out, data may be erased from your hard disk. The system should be returned to head office by courier. Who pays for this depends on the reason for the return. The various types of return are listed in the user manual along with other details. Well, that's it. We hope that we've helped you get started with your PC. Remember, if you have any problems, there is the online help on the PC itself. The user manual and manuals for individual pieces of software offer a lot of very helpful information. And if you're really stuck, then there are the helplines, which can offer personal help over the phone. We want you to get the most out of your new PC. By taking time to get to know your machine a little better, you should have many years' enjoyment. Goodbye. Thank you.